coming up on this episode of Crime Family. That's also like really random too. Like if that wasn't Leona, like why would some random person send that to Leona's aunt? Like it doesn't really make sense. There also were some theories that had come out about the case. Like she was picked up by someone who had like evil and malicious intentions while hitchhiking in Yellowknife or that you met with foul play while in Edmonton. During the weekend that Leah was murdered, the RCMP revealed that the killer would have been someone in the community because the only way out was the ice roads and those roads were closed that weekend, which meant it had to be somebody within God's Lake Narrows community. And according to Leah's cousin, Destiny, Stephen was admitting to an unidentified woman that he had killed somebody, but he never mentioned who. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Crime Family. So this is part three of our Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women series. So last week I did the Amber Tuckerow case and Katie uh, started us off in part one with the Red River Murders. So for part three, Steph is going to tell us the stories of two um, different Indigenous women and their cases and their stories. So Steph, which uh, which cases are you doing? The first story I'm going to tell you about is a woman named Leona Brule, and the second one is uh, Leah Anderson. Okay, and um, like, what was it about those cases that made you interested and wanted you wanted to cover them? Well, I wish I could do them all, but these two cases I chose because there isn't a whole lot of information out there, and I feel like these two women need their stories to be told, and because both of them are still unsolved today. I feel like justice needs to be done for these two women and I feel like their families. Someone needs to know something about both of these cases and I feel like me telling the story, maybe somebody might out there might know. So I decided to do these two because they're similar cases, but they both, but they have different tragic outcomes. Yeah. And I think it's also important, like kind of going to what you said, like we wish we could cover them all. Um, but there is that web the website I will direct you guys to is cbc.ca slash missing and murdered. So this is basically like the main site it has like the database for many, if not all, well definitely not all, but many of the missing and murdered indigenous women in Canada. So I definitely we're gonna put the link to that website in our show notes. So definitely go to that website, familiarize yourself with all of these cases and all of these women because yeah, we can't cover all of them, obviously. So we had to pick the ones that just piqued our interest, the ones that we wanted to cover. But that doesn't mean that the other ones aren't important or are any less important, because obviously they are. And justice needs to be served for all of the, these women. So, um, yeah, just wanted to say that. But Steph, you can take it away. So the first story I'm going to tell you about is about a woman named Leona Brule. Uh, she was born in 1970 in Fort Providence in the Northwest Territories. And this is a really small northern community and has only a population of 695 people. According to Leona's family, she was quite outgoing, full of life, full of love, and a very spirited person. And she was also very protective of her siblings and her cousin. When Leona became a teenager, she like, like most teenagers, she wanted to have a more free life and she wanted to explore life outside of her small community. Uh, so she started to travel to Yellowknife quite often. In Yellowknife, this is where her sister lived. So she would travel to Yellowknife and back to Fort Providence quite a bit, but she would always keep in contact with her family. Um, 
when she was in Yellowknife, she had a babysitting job, like like a living nanny. She was so good with kids, which is why she had this nanny job. Like I said, she would travel back and forth to Yellowknife and back to where she, her family, her parents lived in north, in the Northwest Territories. And around the late, like the late 1980s, Leona started seeing this guy who lived in Edmonton. So she would often travel to Edmonton and travel to Yellowknife. So she was frequently traveling and mostly on the go all the time. Um, because of such the remote places where she lived and she plus she didn't have a car, she would often hitchhike to Edmonton. This boyfriend of Leona's, they're unsure of his name. They never like her family never really knew much about him. She didn't really talk much about him. So that was in the late 1980s when she met this man. It was about the last day that anybody seen Leona would have been about March 15th of 1989. And this was the day that Leona said that she was going to Edmonton again and that she'd be back in a week. Yeah, sorry. Uh, this is uh, just, just a note. Like, I was just curious. So I Google mapped, like, the distance from Yellowknife, Northwest Territories, to Edmonton. And it's about a 15-hour drive. So yes. she would, like, hitchhike. That's crazy. Fit, hitchhike 15 hours. That's a long time. I wonder if, like, she was, like, getting rides with multiple people. Um, like, if they were just going, like, part of the way, and then she would hitchhike the rest of the way. Or if she would, like, hitchhike with one person 15 hours. It's a long way. And it's just just out of my own curiosity so I just wanted to say put that in there but like so people know ge- geographically it is like 15 hours away which is a long time also if you think about that like she might have walked some of the way like does not guarantee she got to drive like the whole way so like 15 hours is like the shortest time it would have taken her she got like a straight drive but if she's only planned to be gone for a week that's almost like two days on both ends just traveling so she really only had like five days to spend in the city Anyway, that's just kind of like thinking about the trip. Yeah, it's also crazy too that like no one really knew who the boyfriend was. Like going, driving 15 hours to a new city in a different province is like weird if like the family doesn't even know who this person is or even know his name at the very least. Like that's kind of odd. And like you said, they didn't really know. It seems like they didn't really know because looking a little bit about this case, like his name has never been out there and it doesn't say anything about who this man was so obviously the parents or her family didn't know much about him or maybe they do it's just not released out to the public i don't know and but. maybe because she like would hitchhike from where her parents lived to where her sister lived maybe they didn't think that her hitchhiking from yellow knife to uh edmonton was a big deal because she was used to hitchhiking but yeah, and like and like I and like I said in the previous episode, like hitchhiking is a big, it's common just in the community anyway. Yeah, so and people don't have cars and remote areas. You have to get to different places. So, and she was like nineteen at the time, so maybe her parents like she was an adult at the time, so maybe her parents just like they knew like how how kind like kind hearted she was, so maybe like they trusted her to get to where she needed to be. Also, this was back in the 80s, so it wasn't, you know, the way you think about it now, hitchhiking was probably a lot more safe back then, or or people just didn't know how danger, dangerous it was because it wasn't, like, that much media out there about serial killers and things back then. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and also, too, like, just because, like you said, and obviously I can tell, too, there's not a ton of information out there on this case, so just because, like, maybe the boyfriend's name's not out there doesn't mean that they didn't know who he was like you know what i mean like there might be a lot of information too that's just not out there because obviously the police aren't doing a full investigation so maybe the family knew who he was like i don't know it just might not be something worth noting so i don't want to say that like oh it's weird that the parents don't know him like maybe they do i don't know but obviously it's not out there like he's not a suspect if didn't come yeah i feel like he would have been like one of the first suspects they would have talked to so maybe they just ruled him out and he's just like his his name's just not related at all to the case yeah because like i'm just, yeah because i just don't want to say that like oh he's like how yeah. does no one know but maybe they do it's just not out there mm-hmm. yeah that's a good point um so yeah like so on march 15th she said goodbye to her family and said that she'd be back in a week so a few weeks later her family hadn't heard anything but it never did register with them that she was missing or anything was wrong with her 
because they thought maybe like she was just having a good time and that she'd be back and what really started to get them to worry is that those phone calls stopped becoming more frequent and then they just stopped at all like they just stopped so like she was not in contact with her family after the f- few weeks after she went missing so which would make sense is why her family never reported her missing for a while when the family did do open up in a missing person's case it was hard for the police to do a proper investigation because they had very little information to go on the family didn't have a solid timeline of where her last whereabouts were they didn't know what she was wearing at the time they thought maybe she was with her boyfriend but they didn't like like Avi said earlier like they might not have like known who he really was so they're just trying to piece together this missing person's case with very little information that they had at the time when she was just the at the time of the disappearance um it was said that leona was living this transient lifestyle which in most cases is deemed like a high risk behavior and this made her disappearance very suspicious they also suspected that drugs and alcohol were being used it's also likely that she was living on the streets in edmonton because they they there was never like she never gave like a address of where she was going in Edmonton. So so, so pe- maybe her maybe her boyfriend was homeless too or something. Maybe which would make sense that they couldn't track him down or they didn't really know anything about him because maybe they like maybe he did, didn't. But like he didn't a have yeah address. like he didn't have a home address or something yeah. Uh, the RCMP said that her family thought that they seen her in 1990. But unfortunately, those sightings were never confirmed, which is why in most in her reports, her last known whereabouts was in 1989. There's also witnesses also came forward saying that they saw Leona um, in Fort, Fort McPherson in the Northwest Territories. This tip forced the police to travel to Fort McPherson to find the woman that the witness say that looked like Leona but once they got there they realized that this woman was not Leona and unfortunately the case was starting to go cold because there was no more leads and no more information about her whereabouts but after her disappearance Leona's aunt received a letter from Florida and in that letter there was a newspaper clipping of a weight loss program that said Kathy, check this out or something to that effect. I think that's what it was. Yeah, I think it said, Kathy, this will help you. But, like, nothing else. No. That's super weird. And she didn't know who it was from, obviously. That's also, like, really random, too. Like, if that wasn't Leona, like, why would some random person send that to Leona's aunt? Like, it doesn't really make sense. Well, because Kathy thought it was might have be, be, been from Leona, right? At one point. Or something because it didn't really know who it was from but like why would it be from leona like yeah she's been looks- missing for a long time and doesn't say mm-hmm. anything just sends a, yeah. a newspaper clipping say this will help you they like describe it as like a suspicious package so they're like kind of like weird about it when they get it so i don't know it just seems super weird but well, obviously someone who knew her name and her address and like the fact that she'd be interested in something like that maybe i don't know yeah that is weird so like kind of questions either way if it is leona like, that's super weird why it would like should be missing end up in florida and then send her that without saying like oh hi how are you like i'm okay or whatever right but if it's not from leona like that's also weird yeah both ways it's like a weird thing yeah that's sketchy mm-hmm. so the police did confirm that like that was not the letter was not from leona or they think it wasn't from leona um they also state that like her health card and her social insurance card were have not been used since her disappearance, and that's about it for that. Like for like until like thirty years later, like after that letter, nothing else came out about the case until about thirty years later in two thousand eighteen. The RCMP renewed their call for more leads in the case and asked the people to reach out in social media and to make this case known again and to find out any new, any new information that might be out there 
I'm not sure why it took them 30 years to ask for help or ask for leads. I feel like maybe because so like maybe because social media is such a big thing now, maybe they thought it would be somebody might know something all these years later. No, oh, well, I was just gonna say like sometimes you know you hear of like cases that have gone cold and then like you know 20 30 years later like somebody new with a fresh pair of eyes comes in to like try and look over some cold cases so that could have been what was happening like a newer cop coming in being like i'm gonna put some like fresh you know eyes on this yeah i was like thinking like obviously social media didn't exist back in the 80s when she went missing so maybe it's like now after like you said katie in your first the first part like the tina fontaine like you know renewed interest in all of these you know cold cases of indigenous women so maybe they were like oh now with that renewed interest and with now social media is a thing we'll try and see if this would like lead anywhere so it could have like drummed up some interest in like her case just through that potentially but yeah 30 years is a long time like they've gone 30 years and nothing yeah like they also um like they're trying to get like new leads new information but they also have um the family's DNA on file. Like, just in case, like, her body showed up. Or, like, they found her body. They'll have... They have DNA on file to match. And as of 2020, like, her case is... Leona's case still remains open. The police... The RCMP still have an open communication with the family. And the family said... Says that they are satisfied with how the investigation is going so far. I mean, the family doesn't really know a lot about her whereabouts or about like when she went missing either because like she traveled so much and she was just like always traveling to and from wherever. So they don't really have a whole lot of to go on like timeline wise either. I was gonna say, I'm wondering like if back in like the 80s, if they would have if they would have found like an unidentified body if they would have known to like keep that DNA to test it later and if they did I wonder if they're gonna go back and like test some of that old DNA that they found from older unknown bodies with some of like Leona's family's DNA like is that something that they'll just do or does somebody have to kind of initiate that I wonder yeah like that's a good point like they could have found her body back in like recently after it happened in 91 but it was just like they couldn't identify it or something and maybe it was like just a Jane Doe but now that they have the DNA on file like I don't know maybe that's a lot of years for it to get lost or they don't have the record there to like match because there's so many Jane Doe's that are found right so how do they know yeah who it belongs to so there's also so many questions in the case too like they don't even know if she actually made it to Edmonton and if she did was she on the streets or how long was she in Edmonton before she was killed or how soon after she left maybe she was killed like you know the day after she left or something like we don't know so many miss like so many questions and that's a huge trail from northwest territories to edmonton like so many possibilities along that route and so many remote locations too probably that like you know out there in the wilderness like nobody would ever go out there unless yeah to hide a body yeah that's true and also just an interesting point i wanted to know like when you said the family said they were you know satisfied with the investigation it's such a stark contrast from the amber tuckero case with obviously her family's you know filing lawsuits and all that stuff so the fact that the family's satisfied with the investigation at least that's something but it hasn't resulted in anything which is frustrating i feel like the reason why they're satisfied is because they don't know like where her last whereabouts but they don't know much about what her life was like because she, even though she had contact with her, she was traveling so much. So, they, so they, they know just as much as the police know. Like, well, yeah, I think yeah. Like in Amber's case, like there were so many things, like potential leads that could have been investigated, and they weren't. Whereas in this one, it's like the family's acknowledging, like, yeah, there's literally nothing to go on. So it's not like it's not like they know of stuff that the police didn't follow up on. It's like they just know that there's nothing to follow up on, which is frustrating. So yeah, like her case, like I said, her case is still open. Um. There also were some theories that had come out about the case, like, um, that she had met with Farrow Play, or, like, she was picked up by someone who had, like, evil and malicious intentions while hitchhiking in Yellowknife, or that she met with Farrow Play while in Edmonton, or the, or she never even left, 
or she was murdered before she even made it to Edmonton. There's so much like speculation around like her disappearance. Like, did she even make it to Edmonton? There's a 15 hour walk slash drive from Yellowknife to Edmonton, so like she could have not even made it to Edmonton, or even at a Yellowknife for that matter. So there's just a lot of speculations, a lot of theories that people think, but there's just no hard evidence to go on. Or, um, or she could have made it to Florida. Send yeah. The letter. Which is like I I doubt that's true. Or like that's from her, but yeah, but she could have really went beyond Edmonton and went like anywhere across Canada or even into the states. Like she could have mm-hmm. really went anywhere. So if Leona was still alive, um, she would be fifty-one years old. At the time of her disappearance, she was about four feet six inches tall. She weighed about one hundred and six pounds. Um, she has brown hair and brown eyes. She has some distinct. Um, scars on her body and one of them is a circular shaped scar on her upper right cheek. Her disappearance is also known as like a uh, endangered missing because she's been missing for so long. They classify it as endangered. So if you have any information concerning Brulee's whereabouts you can contact the Royal Mounted Police at 867-699-3291 if you want to send your tip in anonymously, you can do that by c- calling Crime Stoppers at 1-800-222-TIPS. That's 1-800-222-8477. So the second case I'm going to be talking to you about is the story of Leah Anderson. Leah was this very vibrant girl. She was full of life um, despite her rough start to her life. Leah was in and out of foster care for most of her childhood. After her father was murdered in 2003, her mother found it hard to cope with the grief, which led to her falling into addictions to cope with the loss, which is why Leah was put into foster care. Leah was living in Thompson, Manitoba, but after the murder of her dad and her mom's addiction, the city's child welfare got involved and Leah and her three siblings were sent into foster care. Leah was sent to 13 different foster cares before her her aunt stepped in in 2005 and that's when they were allowed to move to God's Lake Narrows which is a town of a population of 1300 and is the only and the only accessible road is by ice roads in the winter or by air. Once Leah moved to God's Lake Narrows, she started to become very involved in her Cree community. She was well known in her community, which is why she was rewarded the youth chief because she was trusted by everyone in her community and everyone knew her. She was friends with a lot of the people and had a huge social circle. She was on a good path to a bright future. She was very artistic. She was very talented when it came to dancing, singing, and she wanted to go to the university, the Arts University of Winnipeg. And she was very excited to achieve that goal and she worked really hard at her academics to make sure she had the grades she needed to make that dream a reality. So on January 4th at around 7.30 p.m. was the last time Leah was seen. On this day she was supposed to go skating with her friends at a local arena. This was the last day before she was supposed to head back to school but her friends ended up not going skating. Leah decided to go anyways. So she texted another friend while she was there, and before she left the house, her uncle told her that she had to be back by curfew. Leah was always one to, like, obey curfew. She never broke the rules. She was always home on time. Like, her aunt and uncle could always trust her. So when Leah didn't show up back home after skating, they figured that she just ended up going to a friend's house for the night. But when she didn't return home the following day, this is when her family decided to get a little bit more worried. So something didn't really sit right with them, so they got a group of people together from the community to perform a search for Leah before they even went to the police because they figured it was such a small community, like like there's 1,300 people, but where she lived was quite small. Um, so they figured that they'd just get a group of people together and like search some houses but unfortunately like they came up empty-handed 
two days later after she went missing, which was on January 6th, the family heard over the radio that a body was found near a trail that was known as the Snowmobile Trail on the reserves. And because the community was so small where Leah lived, it was quickly determined that it was Leah's body. And this was determined because they actually did a head count in her community. And the only person that was missing was Leah. Um, Leah was... So, so, that's, so like they just got the whole entire town together and just did a head count of everyone? Yeah. They did oh. confirm it by DNA after, didn't they? Or or by looking at her, they could tell? Or? Yeah, Leah's, Leah's sister was able to identify that it was her because she was still wearing the skates and holding on to the bag that she took with her the day that she disappeared. During the investigation, it was determined that her body was found at 10 a.m. that morning on the 6th on the trail, the snowmobile trail. Her body was disfigured and the police originally thought that she was a victim of like wolves or she was attacked by wolves and wild dogs. But during her autopsy, it was determined that she was actually beaten to death. So now they they knew they had like a, hom- a homicide on their hand. And when they examined the body closer, they noticed that she had defensive wounds, meaning that she fought with her attacker. It was also determined that she was killed before 10 p.m. on January 4th, and the killer just dumped her body on the trail. There wasn't a whole lot of evidence at the trail because the day they found her body, it had snowed pretty heavily that morning. So it was hard to, like a lot of even, a lot of evidence was tampered with because of the heavy snow. During the weekend that Leah was murdered, the RCMP revealed that the killer would have been someone in the community because the only way out was the was the ice roads and those roads were closed that weekend, which meant it had to be somebody within God's Lake Narrows community. And at the it's, time of It's creepy. It's like one yeah. of it's like it's like one of those like, you know, one of it's one of you in the community, like they're doing the head count. It's like, well which one of you is the one who did it? It's so creepy. And at the time of this murder, there was only like 284 houses on the reserves, which gave investigators hope that this would be like an open shut case because they could go door to door and like try to find evidence because it was such a small community that, that she lived in. But unfortunately, that was not the case. What they thought would take days turned into years. And at this point, RCMP think now they're starting to think that it was somebody outside of the community. Where she was, her body was found, like I said, it was like the snow snowmobile trail. And this trail was used quite frequently for people who would often smuggle in alcohol through that, that trail, which gave, and then which would give them access to like snowmobiles. So it could have been somebody from outside the community. Leah's family was becoming worried that there would be like lack of evidence and that her case would never be solved. Um, There were a few rumors going around. One of the rumors was that she attended a house party of one of her friends named Josephine B. And that Leah's boyfriend went to find her at the house but was denied access to the house because it was an all-girls party so they wouldn't let him in. Other rumors involved like Leah's boyfriend Max, Max's cousin, which was Leah's friend's brother, Stephen Chubb. And according to Leah's cousin, Destiny, Stephen was admitting to an un- unidentified woman that he had killed somebody, but he never mentioned who. So the police took Stephen into questioning, and he was given a lie detector test, which he passed. And during those investigations, Stephen admits that him and Leah had a secret relationship, but that ended months prior to her death. So he was ruled out as a suspect. Because they could never, they never did confirm like that he actually said he had killed somebody. Like that was just hearsay from like two people. So in April 2013, the RCMP and the community offered a ten thousand dollar reward for any information leading up to the arrest in the case. And two years later, in 2015, a girl was murdered in the same community. And it was 22-year-old Crystal Andrews. She was murdered in 
the same area as Leah was. And her family and Leah's family were all protesting outside of the RCMP office, offices because they were angry because of the slow, how slow the investigation was going and that nothing had been done for a while. And they wanted some answers. And then just two years later, in 37-year-old Michael Williams Mossgrove was arrested and charged with the murder of Crystal Andrews. They ruled him out as a, as a suspect in, in Leah's case. Not really sure why, they didn't really give a whole lot of information, but he was never a suspect in her case. So a DNA swab was taken from Stephen. So Stephen was, hope, was hoping that the DNA would clear him as a suspect. And in 2019, it was determined that the DNA collected from Leah's clothes and body showed DNA of an unknown male. And the SNP turned to social media numerous times to try and dig up any leads in order to help the RCMP solve the case. They also had the RCMP had a very long list of suspects. They were trying to narrow down a lot of those suspects on the list. They were all ruled out and the police say that her killer was known to her and it was someone that she would have trusted. So I'm assuming it wasn't Stephen because if they had his uh, DNA in the system and then they had the DNA found on her body then they would have connected the two together but yeah and this is like they say that it would have been someone who was known to her and someone that she trusted it's like why does it have to be someone that she trusted if she just like was like you know taken on her way to like go skating or something like it's not like you know somebody picked her up and she would have gone willingly in someone's car which maybe like i feel like there's like a missing piece there like what makes them think it's something that she trusted if it's just someone who just you know attacks her that doesn't have to be someone she trusts. Yeah, and just because she all. went with someone doesn't mean she wasn't being forced. Like, they could have taken yeah. her. Yeah, so it doesn't mean she wasn't just, like, you know, just because she went doesn't mean it was willingly, right? Like, somebody could have forced her to go with them. That doesn't mean she trusted them, obviously. Like, I don't, yeah, I don't see how they could figure that out. Yeah, like, it seems a little... If it's someone outside, then it could be, you know, obviously it increases the chance, but still still i feel like there's a very limited it's like a remote town like a remote community even if it's someone with outside the community like there's still not going to be that many people in the surrounding areas necessarily so it still is like a much smaller pool than if it was just like you know an urban center yeah maybe it was like one of those people that was like that came in to like smuggle in alcohol like maybe i don't know if she was like into drinking but maybe she kind of knew one of those guys that would deliver regularly like she got to know him or something he was an outsider but she knew him so that could be a possibility yeah, so, like, the investigation is still ongoing, um, but the police aren't saying any details to the public if they found, like, any new leads or anything like that. They do admit that they've conducted over 270 interviews, and Leah's family is still very frustrated with the investigation, and they just want justice for their little girl. Uh, the community is now rewarding $11,000 for anybody who knows anything about the case. And if anybody knows any information about Leah's killer or any details about the case are asked to contact the Winnipeg RCMP at 204-983-5420 or if you want to leave a tip anonymously you can call Crime Stoppers at 1-800-222-TIPS that's 1-800-222-8477 and those are the two cases I have for you guys today. So next week will be the final part to a four part series and in this episode we will be talking about the highway of tears it should be an interesting discussion and i can't wait to share it with you guys yeah i kind of like bring this mini series like all bring it all together because the highway of tears like you can't really have a discussion about missing and murdered indigenous women in canada without talking about the highway of tears because it's such a significant part of that so we're going to dedicate the final part of this to that whole topic or part of the discussion um so yeah Thank you for tuning in to part three. You can find us on all the social medias as always. You can find us on Facebook at Crime Family Podcast, on Instagram at Crime Family Podcast, Twitter, Crime Family Pod One, and our email is crimefamilypodcast at gmail.com. Send us all your great suggestions, feedback, tips, anything you'd like. Um, if you want us to do another mini series about another topic, maybe you can send us tip or some suggestions for that. Uh, we'd love to hear what you guys have to say. And uh, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts if you listen on Apple Podcasts, because that's how people know about the podcast and see what other people think. And it's very helpful in supporting the show. So, yeah. Thank you guys so much. See you next week for part four. And uh, take care. See you next week. See ya.